Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you here this morning. Let's take our hymn books, open to number 54. We're going to sing 54 transition and go right into 55. You'll see uh, uh, there's uh, optional transition at the end of 54. That's what our plans are this morning. Stand with me as we go to the throne. Heavenly Father, once again, what a blessing and honor and privilege that we have to come and worship you. What a beautiful uh, last few days, and today we're supposed to have kind of uh, really different than what last year brought. Uh, I remember last year, we were about the 11th of the month, that we had a foot of snow, and much, much different this week than uh, a year ago. And we can see what a year change does a lot of times across every avenue of our lives. And we see changes all around us. Fall changes, political changes, all kinds of different stuff that change. But Lord, I want to just say I praise you, I thank you that you are a sovereign God, that you are in charge, and you don't change. You are the same today as you were yesterday, and you will be tomorrow. We praise you, we thank you for the opportunity you give to us to come and sing praises to this great and powerful name and that we can lean on you, your everlasting arms, with great confidence, great faith, because we know that you're the unchanging God, and we praise you for that. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Number 54, my tribute, and then on to bless his holy name. seated. A couple announcements that I want to share with you today. First, before I forget, if you if you need to see this, I know I couldn't see it from if I was sitting where you're at, but Glenn found this in the middle aisle. It's a button, navy blue. I can't even see it holding my hand, let alone out there. Um, a little design. It looks like probably off of a jacket or something, but if you're missing a button uh, and you think it might be yours, it's sitting up here on the podium and come up here and get that later uh, with that. I don't want you to come undone or come undressed. <laughs> we don't need none of that here. All right. As you have known, and I've announced we've had a food shower going on for the Children's uh, Baptist Bible Home, Baptist Children's Home there with it. And we need some help with getting the stuff that we are gathering from Milan to St. Louis, Michigan, um, with it where that's at. And uh, they would like it to be delivered on the 23rd or the 24th of this month. Um, and you have to call ahead to make an appointment. If that's something that you think you might be able to help us out with or to do, please get with Pastor as soon as possible so those arrangements and plans can be made uh, there with that. So... Um, that's announcements in there. You can read a little bit more in there if you have that. Um, or 
call pastor, talk to him personally uh, with that. Uh, you might want to check your mailboxes. Uh, there uh, is more mail in there this week uh, with it. Uh, I think the Christmas card list is in there, and we got it's time to get ready for that. Hard to believe when it's 70-some degrees out and sunshiny, but um, we got to get ready for that. And also a Christmas item coming up, Christmas tea, coming up on November 20th for the ladies, 6.30 p.m. up here in the Fellowship Hall. Sign up sheet out in the hallway with that. Uh, you'll want to sign up for that, ladies. That is a pretty good time with them. This week's activities, um, just a reminder, uh, tonight uh, after our evening service is communion. I'd uh, love to have you come tonight. And uh, with that, pastor's doing a sermon on demands of discipleship. And uh, so we look forward to that and then having communion immediately afterwards. Wednesday uh, evening, youth group at 6 o'clock. Prayer meeting at 7, and then Saturday morning, men's breakfast and Bible study as we finish out um, the attributes of God at that point in time. That's all the announcements that I am going to make this morning. Brother, come and challenge us with the Word of God. Nothing political this morning. I'm sorry, it must break a lot of hearts. <clears throat> Are we ready? I'm ready. All right. All right. Uh, what should you do when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up? What should you be doing? Cheryl. Cheryl. Teach your children diligently, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Amen. By the way, that whole phrase, teach, uh, teach, thy, teach them diligently, is one word in the Hebrew. It means basically sharpen your sword. So you're going to sharpen your children. I mean, get them sharp. You're not going <laughs> to... No, none of that stuff, right? You make sure your children are sharp. Right. All right. Uh, Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson's father was a uh, missionary who brought his family to a Navajo reservation near Flagstaff, Arizona, at the uh, end of the 19th century. On the reservation, young Philip uh, learned to speak the Navajo language while playing with Navajo children. Um, Johnston knew the language, knew the difficulty of learning the language, and also knew the, la the language had never been written down. Everything the Navajos knew about their national history, their family history, and their culture was, and I believe still is, uh, transmitted orally. So it was natural that during World War II, Johnston approached the uh, United States Marine Corps with a novel idea. Since the Japanese, the Germans, the French, and the Italian militaries were likely to crack whatever code the Allies were using to communicate uh, sensitive information, why not use Navajo Marines, uh, train them to use uh, and use the uh, to use. Why not recruit Navajo Marines and use them to communicate sensitive information to other Navajos? Thus began the Navajo Code Talkers. The idea was that the Marine Corps would embed Navajo Marines into whatever units would be communicating that sensitive information, and the Navajos would just talk to each other in their native language over the radio. One Navajo would uh, translate English into Navajo at one end, and another uh, translating from Navajo to English at the other. Uh, the demonstration proved very successful, and the Marine Corps followed Johnston's suggestion, tweaking it a little for words that just aren't in the Navajo language, like tank, missile. <laughs> uh, and the implementation proved just as successful. Not one Navajo message was ever decoded by the Axis forces. Carl Gorman, one of the code talkers, explained their success. He says, for us, everything is memory. It's part of our heritage. We have no written language. Our songs, our prayers, our stories, they're all handed down from grandfather to father to children. And we listen, we hear, we learn to remember everything. It's just part of our language, part of our training. Two quick applications for Christians. Uh, the first, as Mr. Gorman pointed out, is that memorization is a, is a discipline. And like any discipline, can be developed even in our <clears throat> post-40 years. Uh, so nobody gets a free pass on uh, Bible memorization. The, the second has to do with the uh, nature of Christianity. 
unlike the Navajo language, Christianity has both a written and an oral component. The written, that's the Bible, is important because it contains our doctrine and our history, but the other is equally important because like the Navajo culture, um, Christianity is best spread orally. It's spread by interacting with our children, like uh, as it says in the verses, in our coworkers, neighbors, our relatives, our teachers, our grocery store clerks, uh, on and on. And just think, the best part is that we get to communicate the, the most vital information in the world, and we get to do it in plain English. Amen. Next week, uh, Bible challenge will be taken from uh, Psalm 139, verses 7 to 11. Pastor? So a uh, question for you as we go to the next song. How many of you know where you're going? Got a plan in place. Where are you traveling? Good. I'm glad a few of you raised your hands because I was kind of concerned. Because the next song is, because uh, in our way our political climate is going today, we don't know which way we're going politically at this point in time with it. And uh, we have some ideas, but we really don't know. But the one thing that we do know is where we're headed, where we're marching to. And that's the next one song we're singing, We're Marching to Zion. In case you didn't know, you're going to find out when we sing the song, if you're paying attention to the song. Anyway, stand with me as we're seeing four, six. Just before we get into the prayers, uh, we're going to have a commercial right now. <laughs> you think I'm ser kidding? I'm serious. We're going to have a commercial. I'm selling a book. My autobiography has been written and just came out. And uh, I'm selling the book, and a real cheap price, fifty nine ninety five for the book. <laughs> now, none of you look like you even believe a word I'm saying. <laughs> Don't. Uh, seriously, get on a serious note here. Uh, there has been a, a biography written of our missionary, Dr. Bob Cropsey, uh, in a, a surgeon's hand, and uh, they ask us to promote it. And so it's just out, it's available on Amazon. What I'm going to do, this is my copy. So I'm going to put it down here on the community table. Not now, but after the service, if you want to look at it, and uh, it's got in information in there as to uh, where it come, who published it and stuff like that. And uh, it is available through Amazon. So if you want to look it over, then uh, I have not had a chance to read it yet, but it really looks like a, a tremendous book on the life of Bob Cropsey and his work as a medical missionary. But I, they wanted us to promote it, so I brought it for you to look at. Okay, uh, prayer requests. Just some updates real quickly here on a couple things. Uh, pray for John and Sandy's grandson, Steve, and his fiance. They both have COVID. And so pray for them. Pray for Pastor B. He's a couple, three pastors back from us, but uh, he's 90 years of age. He's in the hospital with pneumonia and COVID. And so pray for him. Uh, pray for Rhonda Moorhead. She's been, while everything, all of her tests showed negative, she's been having problems with passing out. And so be praying for her. Uh, remember Jim and Carla and the situation that they're involved in in adoption and just pray for God's will to be done there. And uh, of course, keep remembering Joy and Eric as their baby is soon approaching. And then uh, pray for Myra. She's having a lot of blood problems. A blood sugar problem. She was up over 400 today. The other day she was way down below 100, so it's fluctuating. Just pray that it might grow steady. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Once again, our fathers, we come before you. We are thankful for the opportunity that we have of being in your house and to be able to study your word and have our hearts challenged through your word by the Spirit of God. And I pray, Father, that as we uh, sing these great songs, that our hearts would be prepared for the ministry of the Spirit of God through your word. And especially as we study the uh, subject matter before us of adoption, that you would just uh, do that work in our hearts hearts and not only cause us to love you more, but that one without Christ realizing their need, coming to know Jesus Christ in a personal and a real way. Father, we do pray for the special needs today. We think of Jordan and Jessica and uh, the work they're doing 
while he's finishing up his schooling, yet having a tremendous ministry through the navigators at the University of Minnesota. I pray that your hand would be upon them in a special way, and I pray that the added support that they need to continue this ministry would come in for them. And so again, we just place them into your hands. And then we pray for Paula and just pray that you would just undertake in her behalf, and we know that she is extremely weak and the strength just doesn't doesn't seem to be coming back. And I pray, Father, that you would just undertake in her behalf. We know they've given her some medication to try to help that out. And I pray that that would and that she would get her strength back and even be able to get back out driving and, and uh, perhaps even be able to come back out to church. And so I just place her into your hands and pray for your intervention in her behalf. We pray for Jim Brassfield as he goes for his oncologist report tomorrow. And I pray that the meeting with the doctor would be a good meeting and he would get, uh, be given a clean bill of health and that the cancer's in remission and has stayed there. So we just pray that you would encourage and strengthen him that way. Be with Cheryl as she goes in for her cataract surgery tomorrow on her second eye. And I pray that everything would go well and that there would be no problems or complications and that she would get her full vision back and back to 2020. And I just pray that you would just undertake in her behalf. And then I pray for little William as he goes in on Wednesday to have this scope done. I pray that this time they would find absolutely no polyps whatsoever. And I pray, Father, that he finally has outgrown all that and that your hand would be upon him in a special way. And then I pray for uh, Steve and his fiance that you might undertake for them that this COVID for them is not real serious and that they would quickly be over that and have their full health restored unto them. And then I pray for Pastor B, and we realize the older you are, and especially with pneumonia, that uh, COVID could be uh, life-threatening. But I pray for a miracle in his behalf that you might undertake for him and just <clears throat> not only knock the COVID out, but the, the pneumonia out. And I pray that you would just intercede in his behalf. And I pray the next report would show that uh, he has uh, improved tremendously. So we place him into your hands and, and ask your will to be done. I pray for Rhonda and this the problem she's having with passing out. And I pray they'd be able to get a handle on that and get that straightened around and that... Um, that would cease and it would not become threatening to her job. And then I pray for Jim and Carl and that whole situation that you would undertake for them. And I just pray for a special miracle for them that uh, this adoption would be able to go through and they would be able to uh, get this little boy into their family. And I, we realize the only way it's going to happen is for you to work a miracle. You are a miracle working God. So I pray for a miracle in their behalf. And again, we just pray for Joy and Eric, that they would give birth to a healthy baby girl and undertake for them in such a special way and bless them in this thing. And then, Father, I pray for Myra and the, and the problem she's having with uh, the blood sugar. I pray that they would be able to get this back down and, and not just get it down, but that it would stay steady and not keep fluctuating all over the place. So we just place her into your hands. We pray for others that are sick and laid aside that uh, are not able to be here today. I pray that you might touch and anoint each one of them, lift them from their bed that they might soon be back in our midst. And I again pray that this whole COVID situation would soon pass over and many of the regulars who's just not comfortable coming at this time because of that would be able to come back. And I just pray your blessing in these areas. Now just continue to bless in this service. May we lift up, exalt, and glorify thee. For it's in the precious name of our Savior we pray. Amen. In your bulletin is a song entitled, I Belong to the King. If you'll get that out, stand with me as we sing, I Belong to the King. <clears throat> I'm a 
child of his love. He is never forsaken his own. He will call me someday to his palace above. I shall dwell by his glory, by throne. I belong to the King, and he loves me, I know, for his mercy and child of his love, and he never forsaketh his own. He will call me someday to his palace above. I shall dwell by his glory, by throne. I belong to the King, and his promise is sure that we all shall be child of his love, and he never forsaketh his own. He will call me someday to his palace above. I shall dwell by his glory, by throne. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will. Turn to Galatians chapter 3, if you haven't already. Galatians chapter 3, as you know, we are in the midst of the word adoption, and we're going to be reading about that, getting our mindset and prepared for what the Lord's laid upon pastor's heart. We're going to be reading verses 23 through 29. I will take the odds, you will have the evens in the process here. Beginning at verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For as many of you as has been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. May God richly add to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So many years I cried, cause my soul denied that he would save a wretch like me. So full of gloom and dread that I hung my head, I wouldn't claim the victory. Then one day his love, like a wing dove, settled down upon my life. And I realized that he had authorized my ticket to paradise. authority of the holy word I rise up and take my stand I'm a blood-bought child of the living God who is the great I am I'm an heir to all that heaven holds and no principality can ever take away my royal crown authority it's a mystery why he came to me 
Why he would claim me for his own. Why he pulled me out of the lake of doubt, set me right beside his throne. Why he guaranteed with his seal decree my inheritance, my right. Well, if your foot wasn't stamp, ta tapping in that one, then we'll better get the blood pressure kids out to make sure you're still alive. That was good. Thank you, Janice. Appreciated that. Okay, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. If you haven't guessed it by now, we are studying the subject of adoption. We started it two weeks ago. We held off last week because we had a missionary here. And uh, we will have today and next Sunday in this yet. And uh, so, we'll, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Two verses I want us to look at. Chapter 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And then chapter 9 and verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory of the covenant and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise. Father, I pray the Spirit of God would just open our hearts. Again, give us discernment and understanding of your word. Make the application to each of our hearts. And I would pray that even now in the telecast that those who would be watching that are unsaved, as they realize how important this subject matter is in adoption, that they would trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they might become adopted into the family of God. Bless in our time together this morning. We'll give you the praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we said, our subject matter is adoption, and uh, we're going to just briefly cap where we've been. And uh, when a person is saved, as we've seen, uh, the minute you trust Christ as Savior, you car are becoming a child of God. Uh, that's why we sang the one song today, and we sang the other one, the, the mate to it last time. Uh, this morning, I belong to the king. Last time, we sang a child of the king. We're adopted into the family. We'll become a child of God. But the word adoption carries much more in value than just the fact of being a son of God. When we're born, we are born into God's family. We became, become a child of God. But adoption has more to do with a, an adult or grown-up relationship. 
And so the presenting of it in the scriptures is that we are not just becoming a part of the family of God, but as an adult, we have been adopted to become joint heirs with all that Christ has. We are at that stage where all that he has is ours. We don't have to wait down the road for this or that to happen. It is ours right now because in adoption, he, he presents us as a, an adult before a holy God. He's my equal, if you please. We're not equal with Christ, but when it comes to being joined heirs, we are equal with him. All that is his is ours. We don't realize it all right now, but we will someday. We saw, first of all, the meaning of the word adoption, which means the placing of a son. And we looked at related verses with that to show that how that we are more than just a child of God. We are his son adopted into his family. And we saw a couple illustrations of that, one with Moses and how that Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, and he became the next heir uh, apparent to the, the throne or the next Pharaoh, but he gave that all up in order to become God's servant, though at the time he didn't realize what it was, but because of the truth of God's word and believing God's word because what his mother had taught him, not Pharaoh's daughter, but his real mother, that he chose to follow Israel rather than uh, taking his position as a son of Pharaoh in the courts. And so we saw that uh, phase of adoption, but then we also saw the other side of it in Mephibosheth, Jonathan's only son, when David inquired as to uh, the, any heirs left to Jonathan, he was told of Mephibosheth, who is lame upon his legs, and that uh, he was living off over here, and this individual and his son was supposed to be caring for him, but instead they were robbing him blind, and uh, Mephibosheth was living as a pauper, and the one who was over his estate, Ziba, was hand taking everything for himself. When David found out, he brought him in and told him, this is the way it's going to be for now on. You will care for his possessions, but he will get all that is entitled to him. You will get nothing. And of course, when the king back then spoke, it was a matter of life and death. You do as I say, or there will be a separation, a space placed between your head and your shoulders. And so he immediately decided he better do what was right. But David did something even one step further that was very unique. He called Mephibosheth to the palace. And normally when that is done, it meant that uh, the king is in the process of removing any viable heirs to the throne, which means that he was bringing Mephibosheth in and he was going to have him killed so that he would not be a threat to David. <clears throat> but just the opposite happened. When he came in, David placed him at his table as one of his sons. He adopted him into his family and he got the same level as all the sons of David did. There was no difference between him and all the rest. He became a part of David's family, which he never expected to happen. But that is the grace of God exhibited through David and his relationship. We want to look this morning uh, at the subject of when adoption takes place. And I don't think we'll get that far, but we then will want to look at following that, which we'll pick it up on it next week, the blessings of adoption, and then the evidence that we have of sonship. And so, but this morning, we want to highlight our thoughts on the, the time when adoption takes place. Uh, I, as I was studying this, I, I was just enthralled over what we read in the scriptures, because adoption has taken place in a certain sense it is eternal in its nature. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, According that he hath chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. 
Now, we could digress right here, which I'm not going to, because with that word in there, predestined us unto adoption, you'll have to wait on that, because we'll be looking at that next after we get finish up with adoption, predestination, and election, and what is the true biblical teaching concerning that. But what I want you to note in that passage we read in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. What, what does that mean? Well, before the world was ever created, God had already established certain things. For example, in Psalm 119, verse 89, says, Thy word, O Lord, has been established forever in the heavens. And what he is saying there is that the word of God was written and established before the worlds were ever created. And it wasn't a matter of, of God said one day that, you know, uh, I, I need to get some good word out there to the, the church. And so uh, here's a, luck, a likely candidate over here. I think if we can get Paul to become a child of God and saved, then I can use Paul to do the writing. No, not at all. The words were already written. Paul wrote 14 books in the New Testament. They were all written before the foundation of the world. Uh, Luke wrote the book of Luke and also the book of Acts. They were written before the foundation of the world. In the book of Luke, we see that more than any of the other books that Luke uh, talks on and presents to us medical things. Luke was a doctor. And so we, we get the impression then that, that God wanted to have this flavor in there. So here's a good candidate. Luke is one that loves me, and I'll have Luke write it. No, that's not it at all. It was written before the foundation of the world. It was settled before the world was ever created. The word was established. When Adam sinned in the garden, God was not caught unaware. And, oh, my, what am I going to do now? God already knew what man was going to do. As God, omniscient, all-knowing, knew what was going to happen in the course of mankind. Uh, a lot of people are just all stressed out and bent over, all out of shape on what's going on around us today in, in our society. I'm not. Do I like it? Absolutely not. But I'm not bent out of shape over it. Be honest with you, don't talk with me about it. <laughs> I'm sick of tired and hearing of it all. But the fact of it is that where's our focus anyways? Our focus is upon the Word of God. Our focus ought to be upon His promises unto us. What is his promise? I've gone to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and get you that where I am there ye may be also. And we have a promise that he's going to come and take us home to be with him. And in, in my mind, as I view the, the prophecies in the scriptures, everything that is happening is all within God's divine plan. It doesn't make any difference who's going to be the president of the United States. It doesn't make, make any difference who's going to be the speaker of the house or head of the Senate or anything like that. God is in charge. He's going to make sure the one that he wants in there for his timetable is going to be in there. And what I see that every move, every step along the way is hastening us that much closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not believe the way some preachers believe, and they, they're very bold in what they say, that I believe in the, the return or the rapture of the church. But whenever you hear that, you got to wonder what's going on they put a butt in there, but we have waited over 2,000 years and it hasn't happened. I believe it's going to happen in my lifetime. I believe it's going to happen, but not in my lifetime. So I'm not going to preach on it. Not important. It's, let the next preacher preach it on. I disagree with that 100%. I believe we ought to be right up to tune on what's going on in our society in relationship to the Word of God, and we ought to be lifting our ears up to listen to that trumpet sound and the shout of the archangel because he's coming for us and he's coming soon to take us to him. All of these things were settled before the foundation of the world was ever created. And the Word of God was already written, and God said, I need a personality to match my written word. And he raised up Moses to write the first five books. He rose up Joshua to write. He rose up all the prophets to write. And he chose them 
according to their personality to match what has already been written before the foundation of the world. When it came into the New Testament with the book of Luke and Acts, God had already written it. And he chose a man to follow the personality that those books were written in, and that man was Luke. The 14 books in the New Testament that Paul wrote, he chose Paul, not because he was anybody special. The word was already written. But he chose Paul because his personality matched what God had already written. To have it any other way, saying that God did not know. And our Bible says it did. In the same realm, when it comes to this matter of adoption, we were adopted into the family of God before the foundation of the world. The only thing is that it hadn't become a reality. Why? Because we weren't here yet. It did not become a reality to me till I was about 16 years of age, though I've been in church all my life. It wasn't until then that I realized I was lost and on my way to hell and I asked Christ to save me. Then the reality of the adoption, what God prophesied back here and said was going to happen, became a reality. You say, well, I don't know if I, I, I really understand that. Well, wait a minute then. Stop and think about it. The Bible says that Christ was going to die for sin before the foundation of the world. It did not become a reality until he took his place at Calvary. Then what God said was going to happen finally became a happening, and it was done. God said he was going to adopt us, save us, adopt us into the family of God. We're going to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ way back before the foundation of the world. And that night when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save me, what God said way back then and predestined to have done became a reality. When God said, my son is going to die for sin, he prophesied it before the foundation of the world. When he hung on the cross, it became a reality. And so when we think about the adoption and, and every aspect of that, there is an eternal aspect to every bit of this matter of adoption. Listen again to a, a couple of different verses. Chapter 9 and verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to elections might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. So he is saying that not yet born, then we've already in the purpose of God been adopted. Again, go over to chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. For if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. In other words, God set the adoption procedure, set the whole thing down before the foundation of the world. Why? So that you and I, nowhere, could step up and say, well, I am partially responsible, you know. I, I did this and I did that, so therefore I'm a part of the family of God. No, you had nothing to do with it all. It was all of God's grace reaching out unto us. Secondly, adoption takes place the moment that we believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It is not set, as some teaches, over a period of time. You have to accomplish this and this and this. This has to take place. This has to take place. And, and even as some denominations teach, a second works of grace before you're fully saved. Never did hear them say what happens if you don't get fully saved. Because you've got to have, have faith in Christ, and then you've got to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you only have faith in Christ and ask him to save you, and you don't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you're not fully saved. And if you're not fully saved, then do you or do you not get to go to heaven? They never approach that subject because they don't want to deal with it, because the answer is, if you're going to be honest, no. In other words, when God said, if you uh, trust in me by faith and you call upon me to save you, that is not good enough. you got to add works to it. That's not going to happen. Adoption comes in the minute of salvation. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, 
Now are we, now, now, not tomorrow, not next week, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so it is a present thing. That word in verse uh, uh, 2 of chapter 3 in 1 John, now it's in the present tense. Every time I come into my Bible and I turn to that passage and I look, it doesn't say maybe, hopefully, if you live this way, if you live that way, if you do this, if you do that, it says now, now, right here and now. And every time I open it, right here and now, I know, same as uh, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, hope that someday they will accomplish it all and be saved and go to heaven. No, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Present tense, right here and now. And every time Satan comes to me and says, well, if you were really saved, you wouldn't this, you wouldn't that, and gives me all these doubts and calls God's word in question, all I have to do is go to any one of these passages and look at the now and the shell, and it's settled right there. Satan is the chief of liars. He's the father of all liars. And so you can't believe a word he says. So if God says you're saved now, and Satan says, no, you're not, who are you going to believe? The one that is all truth or the one that is all lies? There is no choice. You believe what Jesus said because his word is truth. And so it's a matter of that God has declared that I am a child of God. Again, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth it not, because it knew him not. Behold, what manner of love, that we should be called the sons of God. What a tremendous position. We have a new name written down in glory. What is that new name? A son of God. We belong to him. We belong to the king. We're part of the family of God. And that can never be taken away, no matter what Satan tries to do. And so we can claim, stand here and proclaim, I am a child of the king. Just like Moses, after he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, could stand up and say, I'm a child of the king, literally. But one day he said, no, I've had enough of this. I want to be identified with God's people and walked away. That doesn't happen to us. We're identified with God. We're identified with his people. We're a child of the king, and that can never, ever change. And you know the great thing about it? Before we were slaves, slaves to sin, but now we are sons of God. Move from slavehood. Even as in the passage that Joe had us read for our scripture reading, we were needing tutors. We hadn't grown up. Oh, let me just jump over there real quick. Easier to look at it than say it. It says here uh, in this passage, um, lost it here, just give me a minute. Uh, verse 26, for we are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. And if be Christ, then ye are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Just before that, he talked about the fact that we, we needed to be, uh, have a schoolmaster to teach us but we're no longer in that position. We are now the son, a son of God. And so our whole relationship has changed and all because of what Jesus did and it was an instantaneous thing. It was not something gradual. It happened just like that. Question is often asked in a service, you give the invitation and somebody gets up to come forward to be saved. As they step out of their seat to come forward, before they ever take a step down that aisle, the rapture takes place. 
they never, they never make it down. They didn't get a chance to pray, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I know Jesus died for me, and by faith I received him as my Savior. So <clears throat> do they, are they left behind, or do they go to heaven? Are they a child of God or no? I mean, they didn't make that prayer. You have some evangelists out there saying that if you didn't say certain words when you got saved, you're not really saved, and you got to come and get saved all over again and say these certain words in order to qualify to be saved. I don't find that anywhere in my Bible. All it says is that if I realize I'm lost and I need to be saved, and he will save me. And I believe when that person steps out to come, that in God's sight they're saved right then. Why? Because they've already in their heart committed, even though they didn't say those special words. In their heart, they already have yielded to Christ and got saved. You know, it's an exciting thing when you see that happen. And I had uh, Sam share a testimony with us in the, on my Sunday school class of uh, a fellow that he tr was wanting to come to our Thursday Bible study uh, but it, because of a situation, wasn't able to come this week. But Sam led him to the Lord. He was there working in his yard, and Sam went out and gave him a track and, and uh, talked to him a little bit about the Lord, and Sam went back in, and then Sam realized he was hungry, and I didn't feed him. Not hungry for f real food, but spiritual food. So the guy had left, and so Sam goes and jumps in his truck, and he drives around until he finds him. The fellow works for Comcast, and, and he finds him and says, I, I should have given you an opportunity to know Christ. Would you like to know him? Can I show you? Oh, yes, and the guy gets saved. He lives over, off in that direction somewhere, and uh, he is uh, going to church over there, and Sam mentioned about our Bible study, I want to come. So he wants to come on Thursdays to the Bible study. So, uh, but here's the thing, you know, when was that man saved? When Sam went after him and Sam said, do you? Yes. And he was saved instantly. The ritual part of it came afterwards, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me. But in his heart before God, he was saved right then and there. And the reality of it all came about. And, and that's why you get them to pray, because it helps to bring about in their mind that reality. You know, do you know when you were saved? I can't give you a date. I can't even give you a time. I know it was night. I can't give you a time. I can't give you a date. I don't know if it was summer, winter, spring, or fall. Only thing I know is I was laying on my bed, and I knew if I died, I was going to hell. And I asked Christ to save me. The experience and the knowledge that I knew I was lost and asking him to save me, that's what I remember. The day and the time is not important. The experience of realizing you're lost and asking Christ to save you is the important thing. Some of you can pinpoint, pinpoint the very moment that you trusted Christ. You have it. You know exactly when it was. Not me. I just know the experience. And it's just as real in my mind right now as what it was when it took place back in 1956, a couple years back. And I can remember it. Clearly, there's a lot of things I can't remember, but that I remember. The same with when God called me into the ministry. That I remember, and it's as clear as a bell in my mind when God called me to preach. At a little camp way up north in Michigan, right up here. <laughs> See that? Yeah. Right there, right up here near the top. So at a camp, this great big rock. I've been back there, and the rock is gone, but the spot is still there. Lake Akiak, Camp Forest Haven. After a chapel service, I went out, and I sat on that rock and was talking to God, and God called me to preach. You say, did you hear an audible voice? I sure did. God said, you're the man. No, he didn't. I didn't hear no audible voice, but I knew in my heart what God wanted. There was no doubt, never has been any doubt. God made it clear. In those times, I, they are as real right now in my heart, in my mind, as what they were when they took place. 
Am I saved? Well, I don't know if I am or not. You should know. You'll never forget that experience. When you were redeemed from a child of Satan to become a child of God, a vast difference in your life, a turnaround, you ought to be able to remember that. If not, you need to ask God to make it clear in your mind. If you're not sure, even right now, you need to pray. Some people raised in church, been there all their life and think because I've attended all my life, I'm really saved. But if you don't have that spot when you realize you are lost and on your way to hell and ask Christ to save you, then there's something wrong and you need to stop and you need to reflect and, and make that real in your heart. <clears throat> Our daughter, when she was young, made a profession. When she became a teenager, my wife questioned her about it. She says, I don't remember it. She said, the only thing I remember is what you and dad have told me. I don't remember nothing about it. And so my wife said, you need to make sure. She went to her room. She wanted to do it alone. She went to her room, got on her knees, and solidified it with God at that point. You ask her now, even though uh, she's not walking, like we'd like to see her walking with the Lord, but you ask her now, and you can't shake her faith. She will tell you, that that day as a teenager, when she went into her room, she got saved. Jeremy, we were in youth camp. I was in charge of the camp. He had to be there because we were there. And we weren't going to leave him alone at home because he's only about yay high. And so one day he says to his mother, I want to be saved. The, the chapel was laid out similar to this, not quite as wide, but it had two little rooms on each side over here, like this we do here. And we slept in that room over on that side. My wife took him in there, and they got down beside that bed, and uh, he trusted Christ as a Savior. You ask him about it, he can tell you right pinpoint to the whole thing right now. It's right there. Michael, we just started a church in Farwell. We were living with my mom because we had no place. We were meeting in homes because we had no facilities at that point. And so we were driving back and forth every weekend from my mom and dad's place in the film area up to Farwell, up by Clare. And on the way home, coming down US 10, before you get to Midland, back then all the kids weren't required to be strapped in and so they can't even breathe and everything and michael's standing up on the seat behind me and he leans over and he says dad i've been thinking about it i want to get saved and uh, i said okay uh, you mean you want to go forward next sunday when i give the invitation invitation he said no i don't want to wait i want it done right now so as i'm driving down the road I'm bringing verses out of my mind, giving them to him, and while we're driving down US 10, heading toward Midland, he prays and asks Christ to save him. You ask him today, and he'll tell you that's when he was saved, coming back to my mom's place from Farwell in the back seat of our car as I was driving along, he prayed and asked Christ to save him. Mike was five years of age, and he remembers it. We need to know, we need to remember and know when we're saved. The third thing I want us to think about on our salvation, our sonship, though it took place at salvation, it will not be completed until the resurrection and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a sense, we are here in this world incognito. The world don't recognize us as a son of God. They don't even accept that position, but we are a son of God through adoption. Someday, that disguise will be cast off, and the reality of it all will become ours. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, rather it be good or bad. When that rapture takes place, we'll immediately go into the presence of God and the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is not as some have taught, and I'd even taught it myself till I realized, was challenged on it and realized I was wrong. But some have the idea that uh, because of some of the verses that said that we can't do anything under the dark, it's all going to come to light and everybody's going to know it. And so they think and taught that when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every sin 
that you have ever committed and have never asked forgiveness for will be highlighted at the judgment seat of Christ and you'll have to give an account for it. Not so. Not so. Why? Because all my sin, all my past sin, present sin, and future sin is already under the blood of Christ, is already taken care of. I'm at the judgment seat of Christ because I am a child of God. And as a child of God, he is there to give me the rewards and the inheritances that I have. Peter says, those that are scarcely saved, what about the ungodly? If there's those of you that have trusted Christ as Savior and you have never gone on with the Lord and you're standing before God empty-handed, what about those that are unsaved? Where are they going to be? They're going to be at the great white throne judgment. There's no turnaround for them. What is he trying to get us to understand? He's trying to get us to understand that when he saved us and made us a child of God, our responsibility is that of propagation. We are to take and propagate and build the family of God. Reach out and, and bring others into the family of God. That's our responsibility. The family of God grows by us. God could have made a, a, an edict and said, this is the way it's going to be in your, you have a choice and, and I'm making the choice for you. You're going to be saved and that's it. God didn't do that. God said, here are the choices for you, hell or heaven. And he's placed you and I there as an ambassador to give those choices out there, to give those around us an opportunity to choose to go to hell or hopefully choose to go to heaven. And so we are God's ambassadors to that end. So when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, it's to get the rewards for what we have done. All of our sins are already covered. Well, what about those unconfessed sins? They're already covered. The only ones going to have to worry about them are the unsaved when they stand at the great white throne judgment because they will be judged according to their works and they will be cast into the lake of fire according to their works. The better the works, the less intense the fire will be. But I don't know how it's going to be. You can discern one from the other. But you know what? I don't have to because I'm not going to be there. You know, I, I'm, I'm missing it all. And I'm not sorry at all that I'm missing it. You know, how is God going to judge you? You've got a lake of fire and this one goes in this far and this one in this far. You know, this one has this much intensity, this, this. I don't know how that works and I don't care. Because God saved me and I'm not going to be there. And I'm waiting for that day when he's going to come back. First Thessalonians chapter 4, one of our favorite passages on this, beginning at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18 says, Wherefore comfort you one another with these words. You know, and, and as I'm reading that, I'm thinking on what he's saying here. When he comes, it says there will be the, a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The shout. What is the shout? We don't know for sure, but I, I got a fairly good idea. Because you go back to the Song of Solomon, which is a, a picture of the bridegroom coming for the bride, Christ coming for the church, which is the bride. And before the bridegroom ever sees I mean, before the bride ever sees the bridegroom, he gives a shout. In Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 10, and it's uh, reiterated a little bit, few, few verses beyond that also, but in uh, chapter 2 and verse 10, the bridegroom gives a shout to the bride who has not seen him coming yet, but the shout is giving, given, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And I'm wondering and kind of think that when our Savior comes back, the bridegroom, and it says he's going to come with a shout. May, everywhere else in scriptures, 
he uses scriptures for this and this and this. And, and consequently on that, I lean very strongly to the fact that when he comes, that shout we're going to hear, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And in the moment, the twinkle of an eye, we're gone, just like that. He is coming today, again. And even as our closing song will say, what a day that will be. What a day it will be. I don't know about you, but you ought to be really excited about that fact of he's coming again. The only ones that can't be excited about his coming again are those who don't know Christ as Savior or those who aren't living for God. And they're going to have to stand there empty-handed. But the Bible does say after that judgment, he'll wipe away all tears and we enter into the joy of the Lord. There will be a lot of tears for believers. But the worst thing of all is for those who have heard and aren't prepared for the coming of the Lord. In other words, you know you need to be saved. You've never trusted Christ as Savior, and you won't be able to sing, what a day that will be. Why? Because you're not ready. That's why God has opened the door so wide of salvation. You can be ready. Very simple. Simply pray, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't help myself, but I know that Jesus died for my sin. By faith, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You're saved. A child of God, just like that. And you can stand and sing, or sit and sing. What a day that will be. A glorious day. He is coming again. Are you ready? Father, I pray the Spirit of God would challenge our hearts. We are so thankful that you have adopted us into the family of God, and we have this hope. No matter what goes on around us in our country, in this world, it doesn't make any difference. You're the one on the throne. You're the one pulling the strings. You're the one in charge. And Father, help us to have tunnel vision, to look upon you, and to rest upon you and your word, and not the situations and circumstances around us. But help us, Father, not only have our eyes lifted up, but our ears in tune for that shout and that coming of the Lord Jesus, the sound of the trumpet when we're caught up. May each listening this day know beyond a shadow of a doubt. If not, I would pray that even right now they would trust Christ as Savior that they would be able to sing also this great song. What a day that will be. Continue to speak to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Number 762, 762, what a day that will be. We'll sing both verses. If you don't know Christ, I'll be waiting at the front. You come, allow us to take God's word, show you how you might be saved. If you're on the telecast, bow your head right now. Ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. Let us stand as Brother Joe leads us, 762. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. Jesus. 
Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand, and leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Heavenly Father, what a day that's going to be, just like what we sang, there's going to be true peace. We have people in our society today, this is peace, 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 and we see no peace, but when you give us peace, we have peace eternally. Grateful to be called a child of the King. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us will live our lives in accordance to that, that we are children of the King. Uh, we have promises, and Lord, that we can live by these promises and that you are in charge, you have a plan and a purpose in all of this, and we can take heart in that very plan because we're a child of the King. And Lord, I just want to praise you and thank you for that. If you'll tarry long enough, I pray that you bring us back again tonight as, as we look into this area of discipleship, Lord, and, and be challenged from your word once again. And I pray for those who are watching the live stream, Lord, that uh, maybe even watch it a little bit later. All of a sudden, your word, sharper than powerful than any two-edged sword, will speak to the heart that they will. Lord, call upon your name and believe with their heart, and they will be saved. There's no questions. And Lord, I just pray that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.